South Australia has a new chilling chapter. Ten teenagers in two years charged with horrifying violent killings. Pirio campaigner was stabbed at least 39 times. Two 17-year-olds killed Anne Redman. Found her lying on the back wall. They've knocked her to the ground and cut her throat seven times. What possesses 17-year-olds to do that? All murders by their nature are violent, but Kapunda was in another league. I've heard coppers say they've never seen that much blood. They don't deserve this. You can be forgiven if you're in that community for wondering who was going to be next. A gorgeous young girl put to bed by her mum the next morning, missing. The alarm was raised by her parents just after 6.30 this morning. If someone is watching this, don't hurt me. <laughs> it's the new stranger danger. Your children are exposing themselves to online predators. This was the first case of its kind in the world. Her death was brutal. It was probably one of the worst things I've ever seen. A twice convicted child killer. He is a predator. Her remains have never been found. I miss everything about her. Adelaide has had a very bad run of sex killings, kidnappings and disappearances. She'd been strangled and dumped. The body count in Australia's worst serial killings has risen to ten. South Australia has a new chilling chapter. Most have been mutilated, their legs and feet cut off. People could just disappear off the streets. Adelaide has always enjoyed a local and international reputation as a friendly and welcoming city. But tragically, the city has also become known for some of Australia's most horrifying crimes and most sadistic killers. Eight people were discovered in sealed vats in a disused bank vault at Snowtown, north of Adelaide. Australia's worst serial killing. They don't deserve this. All were drugged and held captive, in one case for up to five weeks. These people are predators. They're evil. In 2010, 300 members of the public became witnesses to a brutal homicide. Zylo Abraham Zadeh stabbed his wife Sarah in front of hundreds of guests at the convention centre. The incident flared during the night and resulted in the man stabbing the woman toward the end of the event. 32-year-old Peter Livingston and a friend were planning to go to the pub. The friend went to the bedroom to change, and when he returned, Peter was gone. Two weeks later, Livingston's severed arms and legs were discovered almost nine kilometers away in a storm drain. But even these shocking cases pale in comparison to the events of Father's Day 1971 in the town of Hope Forest. Clifford Cecil Bartholomew murdered his extended family, including his own children, in a wild rage. He executed his family. The 17-year-old daughter said, don't, Daddy, don't. He shot her in the head. It was Adelaide's very first taste of a mass murder. I've always believed it's a given that husbands are there to protect their wives. Fathers are there to protect their children. He failed. He failed. broke the law, every law. And that makes him an evil person to me. But where does this evil streak come from? Has it always been there? With these questions in mind, author Sean Fuster followed Adelaide's history all the way back to when the state of South Australia was just an idea. South Australia owes its very existence to Edward Gibbon Wakefield, a man that was a progressive social thinker. Wakefield wrote very persuasively about his concept of what he called systematic colonisation, which was a very new idea. Let's settle a colony in Australia with no convicts, where free men and women will decide their own fates and he came up with this absolutely brilliant, history-altering idea while he was in prison, serving a jail term for kidnapping a teenage girl 
and forcing her to marry him against her will. In England in 1827, the smooth-talking 30-year-old lured a young heiress out of her boarding school with a fake letter. Wakefield had the 15-year-old girl abducted and convinced her to elope. When the authorities caught him, the marriage was annulled and he served three years in jail for his crime. Within 30 years of his release from prison, his entire criminal history was expunged, whitewashed. And to actually get the information I needed about his past, I had to go to New Zealand because no South Australian child is taught that the man whose name is on everything is a would-be child rapist and kidnapper. Just over 150 years later, Adelaide had spawned a string of atrocious crimes, including the serial murder cases of Truro and the family. And then in January 1983, the city discovered that no one is safe from evil, even in their own home. Louise Bell was 10 years of age, a lovely kid. All of the natural things that a kid of 10 would be. Here we had a gorgeous young girl put to bed by her mum, as she'd done countless times before. And the next morning, Louise's mum finds her daughter missing. Colin Bell and his wife, Diane, say they've been staying home waiting for news and trying to keep up appearances for Louise's younger sister, Rachel. The alarm was raised by her parents, who discovered her empty bedroom just after 6.30 this morning. I was just wondering to say, please come home, Lou. The Bell family lived in the lower middle class suburb of Hackham West. Louise and her sister Rachel shared the same bedroom. But tragically, Rachel never heard her older sister leave the room. Louise was sleeping in a bed which was right in the corner of the room. The fly screen in front of Louise's bed had been damaged. The Police Technical Services Unit has also been performing tests on the fly screen on her bedroom window. The tests are inconclusive at this time and they're no benefit to us, I'm sorry to say. So you can't rule out the possibility there's been an intruder? We can't rule out that possibility, no. But investigators also couldn't rule out the possibility of a runaway. There was no signs of struggle. There was nothing else found on her bed, no blood or anything like that. With so little evidence to go on, multiple emergency services joined together to help in the search for the missing girl. The initial planning for the massive search was formulated at the Christie's Beach Police Station this morning. It involved police chiefs, staff force, the CFS and the State Emergency Service. We started doing massive door knocks and speaking to people in the area and obviously the seriousness uh, level was raised. The face of the missing 10-year-old girl will be seen on STA buses and just yesterday the government posted a $5,000 reward for her return. A huge search by more than 100 police, staff force, the CFS and the State Emergency Service has failed to find anything. Her father, Colin, anxiously waited at home. Why did she leave, do you think? Well, if I knew that, we wouldn't be looking for her. It was quite obvious after time that she just hadn't run away. Louise's parents, Colin and Diane Bell, were trying to cope with the loss of their daughter and their growing fears about the sinister nature of her disappearance. I'm convinced she's not hiding anywhere. And if someone is watching this, don't hurt me. <laughs> Colin and Diane were living every parent's worst nightmare. The possibility that their child had been snatched from her bed while they slept soundly in the room next door. Adelaide had never seen anything like it. It certainly made every parent look at their child's safety, um, even in their own house. This gives you a bit of a feeling how Colin and Diane felt. He said, we put our light on in the shed. I said, why do you do that? Because we think that she might come back one day, and if we're not home or if she can't get in, she can stay in that shed overnight. I just want everyone to maybe look at their children and think, what would they do if their little girl or little boy was missing? While the Bell family were preparing for the worst, nothing could prepare them for what would happen next. Over the ensuing weeks, 
after Louise was taken. Her abductor taunted police. Initially, he made a phone call to a neighbour. Superintendent Edwards won't say when this person contacted police. As a result of a communication from a man, it is believed that Louise Bell is being held at an address in the Adelaide area. He said, just to prove that I am who I say I am, if you look underneath a brick at the corner of Beach Road and South Road, they will find Louise's earrings. The police went straight and lift up the brick and there were a pair of earrings and they identified them as belonging to Louise. There was now no doubt that Louise had met with foul play and her abductor's taunting didn't stop there. Louise's folded up pyjama top was left neatly on a neighbour's lawn. It's a mystery which has grown deeper with every new day that's passed since Louise was last seen. Why would he do that? Many of us have tossed it around a, a number of times as to what, what's he up to there. Is he playing games? Is he taunting us? You really have to wonder what his motivation was. Do you liken it to a pyromaniac who lights a fire and then half an hour later is one of the faces in the crowd watching the fireman put it out? Did he get some excitement out of it by doing that? I don't know. There could be all sorts of reasons. Obviously, this person only knows themselves why they've done this, and I just hope that they have some spark of humanity left inside them. If they're watching this program, to please do something for her, not to harm this little girl, please. During the investigation, police discovered that a convicted pedophile was living just minutes away from the Bell House. We interviewed at length a male person who appeared to be of significant uh, uh, interest to us. Ten months after Louise was taken, cleaner Raymond John Giesing, who lived 500 metres from the Bell House, was charged with her murder. There was a significant circumstantial case that resulted in this man being convicted. He was found guilty and spent 17 months in jail before his conviction was overturned. I had a feeling yesterday that I would get off and it was happened. In 2010, Giesing would again be convicted of child sex crimes against two young girls. However, with no new information, the investigation into Louise Bell's disappearance had come to a dead end. In January 1989, a young boy went missing from the southern town of Murray Bridge. Michael Black, age 10, rode his bike down to Sturt Reserve to go fishing. He's quite a keen little fisherman. Then he didn't come home. The last sighting of Michael Black had been in the populated area of Sturt Reserve. But mysteriously, his belongings turned up somewhere else. His dog and his clothes were found two kilometres away at another reserve called Tilly Reserve. Investigators were puzzled as to how Michael had moved locations without being seen. But these concerns were overshadowed by the growing theory that he had been claimed by the Murray River. People found his dog running up and down crazily along the riverfront, and they found his bike leaning up against a tree right on the edge of the Murray. A significant search was undertaken for Michael, but no trace was ever found of him. With the mighty Murray refusing to offer any clues, detectives were again left with insufficient evidence to move the investigation forward. We never got anywhere until the young teenage lad who lived in the southern suburbs escaped. Almost a year after Michael Black's disappearance, police were alerted to a terrifying incident involving another boy. A 13-year-old lad was abducted, uh, sexually assaulted. He managed to escape and raise the alarm. The boy told police he had been riding his bike when he was tricked into a van. Within 30 seconds of being in the van, the abductor had bound and gagged the boy. He drives down to Maslin's Beach with the boy and he gets the boy's bike and leans it up against the gate. He then drives off and the police find the boy's bike. And where are they? They're out on the sea and they've got boats looking for him. 
Having successfully misdirected the police, the abductor held the young boy as captive at his house through the night. He ties the boy to a chair, and the next morning, this young boy managed to get the bindings undone, and he runs in next door, and the woman there uh, immediately calls the police. Very brave. His strength of character may well have saved the lives of one or two other children. The police arrested his kidnapper, a high school teacher named Dieter Fennick. Fennick was essentially a nobody. He was a mild-mannered school teacher who was obviously harboring some fairly evil secrets. But police didn't know exactly which secrets until they received a call at the Christie's Beach Police Station. That's when it all unfolds, the whole bloody thing. Around the time that the boy had been abducted and then Fanning had been put in the cells, the woman rang up and said he was at our house sometime after the disappearance of Michael Black, and a television article came on, and Fanning said, oh, that's interesting, because I was at Sturt Reserve on that day. And I helped the boy with his fishing rod and showed him my van. They realised pretty much straight away that the similarities in these cases warranted further investigation. When we found out he parked the bike there and we knew about Michael Black, it's exactly the same. He's setting it up to make it look as if the boy has drowned again. So for two cases such as this to happen within a reasonably short time, certainly alarm bells start ringing. The detectives' fears that Michael Black had not, in fact, drowned at Murray Bridge seemed to have been confirmed. Police now believe, as in the more recent case, Michael Black had been abducted. His belongings moved to deceive the investigators. Already in prison for abduction, Dieter Fennig now faced a trial for the murder of Michael Black. Significantly, the trial judge allowed the use of similar fact evidence that being the abduction and sexual assault of the 13-year-old lad. Similar fact evidence is a legal tool that is rarely put into practice for fear that a defendant might be unfairly judged for a previous crime. But in this case, the judge believed that the jury needed to be made aware of the details of Fennig's prior conviction. If you can introduce the evidence, that's huge. And eventually it brought about the conviction of Fennig for Michael Black. Fennig serving a life sentence for the murder. Justice had been served for the keen young fisherman. His murderer had received a life sentence. And investigators had a new suspect for one of Adelaide's most notorious cold cases. Fennig became a suspect in Louise Bevel's murder. Fennig, a former school teacher, still holds a secret which continues to torment the Bell family. Louise had been snatched from her bedroom sometime between the evening of January 4th and the early hours of January 5th in 1983. The investigator's first question, where was Dieter Fennig that night? He was up in Swan Hill in a caravan and his wife and kids were up there as well, but they was in a different van. We said to her, when do you think Dieter came home from Swan Hill, keeping in mind that the 4th and the 5th of January are critical? And she said, oh, no, it was well after that. It appeared to give Fennig an alibi. However, further information from Adelaide kept the hunt for evidence alive. A neighbour was watering Fennig's lawn, and he looked across and he saw some movement at the curtain. He said, I'm here watching this bloke's lawn, and he's supposed to be up at Swan Hill and somebody's home. It turned out the caravan that Fennig had stayed in was a rental van. So I arranged for a couple of the detectives to go around and check as to when that van was returned. And the van was returned on the 4th of January. With Fennig confirmed to be back in Adelaide at the time of the abduction, detectives were drawing the net tighter. On the 4th of January, he knew that his kids were up at Swan Hill, his wife was away, and he was going to play up. For another abduction to happen in the same vicinity where he lived, the same vicinity as the abduction of the lad who was sexually assaulted, it wasn't a coincidence. Meadow Way and Holly Rise are a stone's throw apart. 
the link there was compelling. Once again, the detectives didn't believe it was a coincidence. Not only did Fennig live less than 10 minutes from the Bell House in Heckham West, the most direct route by foot would have taken him through the suburbs' quiet laneways. An offender could easily have used those laneways as a hiding place during the night. The laneways could also provide some passage between Fennig's house and where Louise's pajama top was returned. In fact, that pajama top would suggest another link to the 13-year-old boy's abduction. Before being locked up in Fennig's house, the boy had been blindfolded and taken to another location. The boy can recall two things. One is that there was a definite sound of water running by, and he could hear people playing tennis nearby. Detectives believe that the boy had been taken to the nearby town of Old Norlunga, which lay on the Uncaparinga River. Dieter Fennig was known to kayak on the river. Furthermore, forensic testing of Louise Bell's pajama top had discovered a unique combination of natural specimens. The only place that they're all found together is in the Onkapringa River. Police had begun building a compelling circumstantial case, but they continued to look for something more concrete to connect Fennec to the missing child. Police excavated the house Fennec lived in at the time of Louise's disappearance. They were unsuccessful. Her remains have never been found. But advances in DNA testing brought police the breakthrough they needed. When Louise went missing, DNA wasn't even available to police. Forensic technology advanced tremendously. It was science that ultimately brought Fennig undone, cutting-edge DNA technology from Europe that was able to produce a one-in-a-billion match, linking Fennig's DNA to that found on Louise Bell's pyjama top. That was the breakthrough in the case that finally resulted in him being charged with Louise Bell's murder. Louise Bell's long-suffering father has waited more than three decades for just one word, guilty. Today is the culmination of our struggles to find answers. It is a small victory for Louise. Irony can be a wonderful thing. The fact that it was Fennec himself who gave police such a vital piece of evidence way back in 1983 is extraordinary. Fennig's now a twice convicted child killer who still holds a secret which continues to torment his victims' families. So I would appeal to anyone with information that might assist us in finding Louise to come forward now. While this afternoon's outcome is significant, it is only part of this terrible event. We still want to be able to lay Louise to rest. We might win the case, but in terms of the immediate family and friends, they don't really win anything, do they? They have to suffer this horrific thing for the rest of their lives. In 2010, another spree of murders shocked Adelaide. Unlike the True Road murders or the bodies in the barrels, these murders weren't the work of serial killers. Instead, they were linked by one gruesome coincidence. South Australia has a new chilling chapter. Ten teenagers in two years charged with horrifying violent killings. Bizarre as Adelaide's crime is, you get used to it being of a particular style. But then to have so many young people in such a small period of time take up the baton and redefine what an Adelaide crime was is absolutely horrifying. Some of these murders number among the most grisly ever recorded in South Australian history. It's alleged two 17-year-olds killed Anne Redman, joining a growing number of youths accused of taking innocent lives. She heard noises at the back of her house and went out to investigate and found two young lads attempting to break into her house. She was 84, they're 17. I mean, they could easily run away but they've knocked her to the ground and then they proceeded to cut her throat seven times. I mean, what possesses 17-year-olds to do that? Retired nurse Pirio campaigned 
was stabbed at least 39 times and received 70 wounds from a blunt object. Police announced that they'd arrested two people over Perio's murder. These boys were 14 years old. One stood trial and was acquitted. The other boy was a completely different story. The main offender had an obsession with violent video games depicting murder. It was the realisation of a lifelong goal for him. He's 14 years old and he's realised his lifelong goal to kill somebody. The murders of Pirio Kempinen and Anne Redman were committed just four months apart. In the short time between these appalling crimes, a terrible homicide was discovered that would terrify an entire town. An hour's drive north of Adelaide, this former copper mining town seems unexceptional. Nice little community, just your typical Aussie country town. But in November 2010, Kapunda awoke to the discovery of a horrific triple homicide. And suddenly, everyone in town was a suspect. The victims were found at 11 o'clock yesterday. The tragedy has shocked local residents. Many are in fear. Most people are too scared to go outside. It's just unbelievable. I just don't understand why someone would do this. The offender is still outstanding and should be considered dangerous. Andrew Rose and Chantel Rowe were a popular family and part of the tight-knit Kapunda community. A mum and dad who were hard-working and well-respected in the community. Young Chantel, she had lots of friends, was well-liked in the area. The only surviving member of the family, a son in his 20s, found out about the tragedy while holidaying interstate. Christopher gets on Facebook straight away and says, can somebody check on my family, please? Someone let me know that mum and dad and Chantel are OK. And he gets a message, mate, I'm sorry, they're all dead. Grieving relatives arrived at the Harriet Street home, laying flowers and pleading for help. They don't deserve this. The way they were found turned the stomachs of veteran police investigators. I've heard coppers say that they've never seen that much blood in a single crime scene. The pundit was probably one of the most violent ones I'd ever had witnessed. Um, virtually the whole house was a crime scene. All murders by their nature are violent, but Kapunda was in another league. Yeah, it was probably one of the worst things I've ever seen. These people hadn't just been murdered, they'd been slaughtered. Just something you expect to see in a movie, you don't expect yeah. to happen to your town. I just hope they catch whoever did it soon because the family is all suffering. You can be forgiven if you're in that community for wondering who was going to be next. They had a fair idea that the offender was one of their own. The crime scene examination lasted days, but forensics had found what they were looking for. Police found a trail of blood outside the victim's Kapunda home, the droplets providing police with the attacker's DNA and confirming it was a male. We got to the stage that if we can identify the person whose DNA is there, we have pretty well got our, our offender. Detectives have run the killer's DNA through the national database but failed to find a match. It means the man responsible may well have no criminal history. So once again, we were, we were resorted to interviewing people and discounting people. While the crime scene hadn't yielded the name of the offender, it gave investigators a vital starting point. Chantel was raped and after killing her, the killer redressed her in clean clothes. We understood that she had a party at her house on the Saturday night before the bodies were found. So we decided that we would start with the people at the party initially. Friends of Chantel who'd been in her home have provided voluntary samples of DNA as police seek to eliminate them. We got swabs and prints from all the lads that had been at the party. They're all quite happy to give these uh, samples and prints and there's nothing to think they were involved in any way. None of the young men's DNA matched the sample taken from the murder scene. So the police started to spread their net. We're thinking we're going to have to fingerprint and collect samples from nearly every male in, in Kapunda and the surrounding areas. DNA testing the entire community is a last resort, but many in the town favour the drastic move. As long as they catch the monster that did this, then I don't think anyone in town would object. In the initial 12 hours after the murder, police took statements from literally dozens of people who lived in the town who knew the family. 
part of the investigator's job is to collate all these statements. And I recall reading a statement from one of the lads. He made mention that he knew Chantelle was a friend of hers and then he mentioned a party that she had at her house and he wasn't invited. He also started giving himself an alibi as to where he was, that he didn't need to at that stage. And it's just one of those feelings you get. It just didn't sound right. So he arranged a DNA test of Jason Alexander Downey. It came back positive. The DNA matched Downey. There was a fingerprint in Chantel's blood. That fingerprint matched Downey as well. So it was pretty conclusive that uh, Jason Downey was the offender. An experienced detective's hunch had led them straight to the killer. Jason Downey was a Scottish immigrant come to Australia with his mother to start a new life. He was just a completely unremarkable lad. There was nothing that struck you about him as being extraordinary, um, which, which made it even more bizarre. However, there was one thing that made Jason Downey stand out. He was obsessed with Chantel. He had decided he was in love with Chantel Rowe and that they were going to be together constantly ringing her, constantly bothering her, constantly driving up and down outside her house. He was smitten by Chantel, and I think she obviously said to him, you know, I'm not interested, basically. You know, I have a boyfriend, and, and that's it. And he just couldn't accept it. Just 12 days after the murder, detectives arrested Jason Downey on the strength of the DNA evidence. The accused, understood to be a friend of Chantel, was arrested last night, 100 locals gathering at the Kapunda police station to hear the news. Police will allege Downey attacked the trio after a late night visit to see 16-year-old Chantel, a former school friend whom it's been alleged he was pursuing romantically. Despite the overwhelming forensic evidence, Downey steadfastly refused to confess. When Downey was first confronted with the allegations, he denied them. Jason denied having any knowledge or being having involvement with it, basically. He had denied ever having intercourse with her, and so, of course, he had to explain how it was that his semen was in the body of a dead girl. Bizarrely, Downey offered up his own theory. His story was that the murderer was, in fact, the man who he had seen around the house carrying a green shopping bag. With no evidence to support his strange claim, Downey confessed, but then quickly cast doubt on the authenticity of his confession. He wrote a letter to his family saying that he did not kill these people and that the best deal that he was going to get was to be obtained only through a plea of guilty. This left the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions in a difficult position. As a prosecutor, it's fine if a person pleads guilty and you've got the evidence to support it. But what you don't want to do is people to plead guilty if they're not. So when it came to the trial, I asked the court, unusually, to put the charges to him again. I wanted to remove any doubt about his plea Common sense would tell you that the evidence was so overwhelming. You weren't going to ever be found not guilty. And also, it was good that he did plead guilty in the end because it saved the family going through a trial. But beyond pleading guilty, Downey gave nothing away. This morning, the accused sat handcuffed in court, showing little emotion as he faced three counts of murder. The teenager made no application for bail, with one person telling him to rot in hell as he was led away. He never explained why he did it. We believe that he attacked Chantelle initially, stabbed her a number of times. And, and I think what happened is Andrew and his wife had woken up, and all of a sudden, this man's brandishing two knives. I think the mother was stabbed something like 29 times. The father had multiple stab wounds all over his body. Downey attacked, raped, and then murdered Chantelle. Heartless cold killer. <laughs> what he did to that family, and particularly what he did to Chantel, was just atrocious how one human being can do that to another. Jason Downey was duly convicted on all three murders. The penalty for murder upon conviction is life imprisonment, and he was given a non-parole period of 30, 
five years. But there could never have been a penalty that could remove that great sense of loss and that great sense of pain from the son and from the community. He should never be released. When they say life, I reckon it should be life like they do in America. It means the rest of his life. It's the new stranger danger, and what's so disturbing is it could be happening to your kids in your house right now. Every time they log onto the internet, your children are exposing themselves to the very real danger of being stalked by online predators. This was the first case of its kind in the world. No one had ever been lured to their death over the internet before Carly Ryan. In February 2007, police were called to a beachside town where a body had been discovered. Well, we'd heard about it and a number of us uh, had to go down to uh, Horseshoe Bay, Port Elliot. When I got there, her body had washed up onto the foreshore. This morning, police secured part of the bay known as Freeman's Knob, declaring it a crime scene. The most important thing is to make sure that the uh, crime scene is protected. Because at that time, we don't really know what has happened. Forensic police, with the help of SES crews, found the teenager's ring and a bracelet. Detectives believe it might have been the scene of a struggle. Her name was Carly Ryan, and she had just turned 15 years old. Carly was the light of my life. She loved vintage clothing. She loved her crazy hairdos that she'd do with half a tin of hairspray. She loved dancing. Sometimes she'd say to me, Mum, stop doing the housework and dance with me. And she'd put on some of her favourite songs and she'd pull me around the house and we would just dance like two crazy people. I miss everything about her. The investigation began with no obvious leads. If you can, you get uh, investigators looking at uh, CCTV. We looked at that and we got um, some good images. The CCTV vision showed Carly with a young man and a much older man. The investigators reached out to locals to identify the two men. We set up a, uh, a police information van. And in those areas down there, people are most willing to help because it's their own little community. And we got some excellent information through that van. A witness saw a car there with the back seat down and we looked as if somebody had been living in the car. And the person got a pretty good description of the car. The description was absolutely spot on. South Australian police tracked the car interstate to Victoria's Mornington Peninsula. The owner was a security guard, and he was no stranger to Carly Ryan. One of the big relationships in Carly's life was with the internet. She communicated with a lot of friends online, in particular her boyfriend, Brandon Kane. And what do you do when you're a 14 year old girl about to turn 15? You invite your boyfriend to your 15th birthday party. Brandon couldn't make it. He sent her an email apologizing, but he said, don't worry, my stepfather Shane can come in my place. This man came to their house and he was seen going into Carly's bedroom. Sonia kicked Shane out. Get out of my house. You don't belong here. You completely breached my trust. Go. This set off alarm bells for police. They wanted to find out who Brandon Kane was, and in particular, who Shane was. As detectives investigated their lead suspect, they realized the chilling truth. There was no Brandon Kane. Shane is Brandon, and Shane is also Gary Francis Newman, an internet predator who has 200 fake identities. When police went to make an arrest, they knocked on Newman's door. He was inside, communicating with another girl, just as he'd been communicating with Carly, under a fake identity. 
Good evening. The face of the Victorian man who brutally murdered Adelaide teenager Carly Ryan can finally be revealed. Gary Francis Newman had more than 200 online identities that he used to lure teenage girls for his own sexual gratification. There's no doubt that Newman would have offended again had he not been caught when he was. With 200 fake identities, there's no reason he would have stopped. How many more times has he done this that we don't even know about? How many other girls are out there not realising that they were talking to Carly Ryan's killer, wondering what happened to their internet boyfriends? During the trial, it became clear that Gary Newman was a cold and calculating predator. Nothing prepared me for Gary Newman. I couldn't imagine in my worst nightmare somebody spending every single day of their life pretending to be multiple people to manipulate children. The court learned that after Sonia had removed Gary Newman from their house, he remained in contact with Carly as the young Brandon came. When Brandon says to Carly, I'll come to Adelaide and I'll meet you, can you sneak out of the house and spend some time with me? Because Shane's going to be there because he's my ride. Carly agrees. Tragically, Carly hid the meetings from her mother and told her she was staying with friends. She traveled to Port Elliot, where Gary Newman was waiting with a young man he had persuaded to play the role of Brandon Kane. Newman had to give her what she wanted, and that was a one-to-one -one with Brandon, the object of her affection. He had a young lad who was, I don't want to be too harsh on him, but he wasn't, he wasn't particularly bright. The kid that's standing there on that beach is not Brandon Kane. He's just some patsy pulled into the situation. After meeting up with Shane, it's believed she suggested they come here to Horseshoe Bay. Clearly, Carly felt safe, but her death was brutal. Her murderer attacked her from behind, punching her in the head, pushing her face into the sand before throwing her into the water, leaving her to drown. For the callous, brutal murder of the 15-year-old child, Gary Newman was sentenced to life with a non-parole period of 29 years. When you're faced with something so traumatic that completely annihilates you to the core of your very being, you've got two choices. One, curl up in a ball, or you find something from deep within to fight. And that's what I did. I chose to fight. I chose to fight for Carly. But I also chose to fight for all those beautiful kids out there that deserve to go online, deserve to have good experiences, deserve to be loved, deserve to thrive. Sonia Ryan established the Carly Ryan Foundation, a not-for-profit organization that began educating children and parents about the dangers of the internet. It was about making people aware that there are people out there online trying to look for people to harm. I looked at the current grooming legislation and thought, I don't think it's any good if police cannot act until a child becomes a victim of crime. Sonia Ryan campaigned for a change in federal legislation that would give police the power to arrest potential predators. Senator Kokoschke Moore. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Finally, I say this to you, Sonia. You are an inspiration in the true sense of the word. It was called Carly's Law, and it was passed in May 2017. It's one of the proudest days of my life, watching Carly's Law become legislation. All I could think about was my daughter and think about what she would say, a law created in her name to protect children from harm. A law that came too late to protect Carly. For author Sean Fuster, the case echoes the city's early origins. What happened to Carly Ryan instantly makes me think of Edward Wakefield. Think about it for a minute. Two older men with agendas, writing fake letters to lure young women from their home where they can steal them away from their families. Now, in the case of Wakefield, that young lady survived. In the case of Carly Ryan, she did not. You have the crime that created the city of evil. 
and the crime that redefined it for the 21st century being absolute mirrors of one another. Thank you.